This week in the Master Gardeners course, we learned about invasive plant species. Now, let me start off with saying that I don't personally see eye to eye with the majority of what was taught in this particular section of the course. That said, it has some very important things that we need to take away from it. We need to understand why certain plants are considered invasive because if we choose to grow them, we need to understand if they can be controlled and how to control them. So with that said, one thing that I did take away from this that I appreciate was question number one in our review questions at the end of the course. Define weed. Now in a course about invasive plant species taught at the college level, I was expecting some pretty unsavory definitions of the word weed. I was taken aback when we were given the common and simple definition of a weed being nothing more than a plant out of place. It's a plant that's somewhere that you don't want it to be. Or in other words, any plant can be a weed if it's growing where you don't want it to be. So let's go through the rest of the course. Reason they want to talk about invasive plant species is because in a monocropped ecological system where that's what our economy is based on, certain plant species getting into that crop quickly affect the economic value of that crop. We learned about the economic impact that these invasive species can cause, so one number that was presented to us was $26.4 billion a year in agricultural loss because of invasive species. Here's some interesting numbers for you. They were talking about the non-indigenous species of plants and how the percentage of plants in a given state, how many of those plants are non-indigenous. So for example, in the state of Alaska, 12% of all the growing plants there are non-indigenous. In Florida, it's 27%. In Texas, 9%. Virginia, 17, the Great Plains area, 13%, and in the New England area, 29% of all plants growing were non-indigenous. That's a, a pretty interesting thing to at least let you have some respect about these plants and how quickly they can adapt to new areas and push off the plants that were growing there originally. So by their definition, what really makes a plant invasive? Well, we're talking about rapid reproduction by seed. The plant's capability to quickly produce seed that is viable, that easily germinates at high germination rates, and reproduces seed again time and time and time again. That the seeds can be dispersed by multiple vectors, by animals, by weather, etc. That it can reproduce by seed and vegetatively. So perhaps it produces a viable seed, but it also sends out stolons or runners, but it also has a rhizome that spreads underground. It has to have no special germination requirements. When the seeds find a, a place to rest, it will germinate. It's not going to have to be uh, in a very specific set of environments for the seed to germinate. It has to have a large range of adaptation. It can't just be located to one specific region for it to be classified as invasive. They look for invasive species to either fill a new niche or that they're highly competitive with native species and ultimately they're difficult to control because of everything before that. But what species are actually invasive depends on the environment. Some species are going to be invasive for me that are not invasive for you. They gave us a list of specific plants that are considered by the state of Mississippi to be noxious weeds and gave us reference material to a website where we could look up information about invasives and how to try to approach their control. We then went over a very long list of invasive species that are present in or around Mississippi and around because they are considered invasive and we might have to deal with them in the future. 
Probably the most interesting one of these is kudzu. The repetitive or recurring theme about invasive species seems to be that they were introduced originally with the best intent. Either they were first brought over because they were an ornamental and they were thought to be nothing more than an ornamental, or in some cases they were thought to be an economic addition to, the, to a, an area. Kudzu falls into that category. Kudzu uh, has been grown on purpose and used as a hay forage for animals like Miss Horse back there. Kudzu is actually a very highly valuable forage food. The problem is we can't contain it the way that we like to contain it. And so it gets into other crop systems. So if you're growing a kudzu system for producing hay and your next door neighbor's producing a corn system, he might not like your kudzu system after a season or two. And because of that, it went from being something that the government was purposefully subsidizing and growing on purpose to something that we now subsidize and purposefully seek the, erad the eradication of. So that's one reason why in going into a course about invasive species, I probably have a tendency to be a little snobbish and put my nose up to it because I don't know how we can say that we're really learning from the past and what we're doing moving forward uh, right now. I think that until we learn from the past and recognize that we can't just haphazardly bring in new plants because they worked well in a different region in a completely different biome, uh, if we're not learning from those lessons, then stop teaching me the history of it uh, until you're ready to teach me how we're going to do it better going forward. We learned about a lot of things like Chinese wisteria. By the way, uh, kudzu and wisteria are both nitrogen-fixing plants. Uh, we learned about silk tree, which is commonly called here mimosa, which um, is considered to be uh, an invasive. It is also nitrogen fixing. Uh, now, one here in particular that gets a lot of attention is Chinese privet. And I've got some thoughts about privet. It certainly does grow very prolifically, but my goats love it. And there's not too much anything better than forage that regrows itself every two weeks. We had goats in an area in our property and they completely chewed back the privet all the way to the whips, all the way back to the stem. They've been out of there for two weeks now and it's all leafing out again. I could put my goats in there and have forage for a week for free and I can maintain it that way. I think that perhaps when we identify that a species of plant or a particular cultivar of a plant is invasive, we can think about how can that be a benefit to us uh, rather than a complete, uh, something that we have to try to completely eradicate. Probably the one thing that I didn't expect to hear on this list was Japanese honeysuckle. I had no clue before taking this course that Japanese honeysuckle was considered to be invasive. We have it on the property, and I absolutely love the fact that we have it. It's not invasive on my property. It's where I would want it to be. It produces a nice perfume. We enjoy uh, letting the kids have the nectar out of it when it's in season. I can see how just about any vine can get to become invasive, but it was surprising to me to see that that was on the list. There were plenty of other varieties that we went over. I'm just hitting a couple high points. There were some varieties that I've not had personal interaction with, but I've certainly heard the name, like Purple Loose Strife. And we were given a reference to a database where we can find some more information. Probably the most discouraging thing about this particular section of the course was when we got down into uh, controls. This was probably the only course I can think of where the answer was to go almost straight to chemicals. Uh, it was the, the number one item on the list was first chemicals such as herbicides, then mechanical such as hand removal or equipment, biological such as using certain invasive insects that will take out a particular plant, or physical such as providing shade so that something doesn't grow. While that same level of application was presented in multiple sections throughout this course, 
the chemicals in every other section came last, uh, whereas here it came first. And that concerns me a little bit. That said, we were given the instructions to make sure that we follow label directions, make sure that we're only applying as we're supposed to, taking care for what else is in the area, uh, drift uh, for sprays and things like that. So while it was the first option that was given to us, it also came with due diligence in the application of that. So there we have it, invasive plants. What do you guys think about invasive plants? Are they something that you absolutely must eradicate from your property? Are they things that you can control? Are they things that you can make use of? I certainly see that there are some that you might not want to ever have to deal with. Some that if it got onto your property, it would be a constant battle, especially if you're a large commercial producer, whether you're monocropping or not. I can understand the desire to deal with invasives. I think, however, if we stop using the word invasive and recognize them as being non-indigenous, they're non-natives, and think about how we can work with them or put up barriers against them rather than just kill them off, that there's going to be a better way to deal with it. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time.